day, Mount Calvary family and friends. My name is Lady Rose from the Mount Calvary Baptist Church in Mullica Hill, New Jersey. We are so excited that you have joined us on this day. We will now hear a word from Pastor Rose. Hello, everyone. Today's scripture is going to come from Philippians, the second chapter, verse 12 through 15. Philippians, the second chapter, verse 12 through 15, and it reads as follows. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my present, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as light in the world. My topic today, if not you, who? If not you, who? Whether we like to admit it or not, we live in a time where people like to push problems on other people. We are in a time where when issues come up within our world, many of us wait for other people to deal with them rather than stepping up and taking the lead to deal with them ourselves. Whether these problems or issues that come up are big or small, many times we prefer not to take the initiative of solving them, but just hope that somehow they will work themselves out or someone else will do something to fix it. You know, James 1 and 22 says, but be doers of the world and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. As Christians, we are charged not only to be hearers of the word, but doers and the word at times calls for action on our part. So as much as we may not want to get involved or, and just stay out of things, there are times that we must also take action. If not you, who? Last week, we were in Philippians chapter 1. And today we are discussing chapter 2. Now last week we talked about how Paul wrote this epistle, this letter to the church at Philippi while he was in jail in Rome. And in chapter 2, Paul starts off by encouraging the saints. So he starts off and he tells them to be united as one and to consider uh, others more important than themselves. In other words, uh, he was talking about unity in the body of Christ. Paul then goes on and talks about who Christ was, and because Christ was who he was, he states in Philippians 2, 10 through 11, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And now it brings us to our scripture at hand that we will discuss today. So let us look at two of the four scriptures that we looked at, and I'm going to go to verse 14 and 15 of Philippians 2. It says, Do all things without grumbling and disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God, without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Paul in this scripture mentions the Philippians being in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Now many theologians believe that Paul was referencing the Israelites when they were being rebellious towards God when he talked about crooked and twisted. And at the time that at that time they were a uh, crooked and twisted generation. And so as I think about what Paul gener uh, what generation Paul was referencing I have to think about where we are in this time in our world. And because of sin, we too live in a crooked and twisted generation right now. And the major problem with living in a crooked and twisted generation is when people don't even realize that they are crooked and twisted. Because if people do not realize, then why would they change? And if there is no change, things don't get better, things get worse and that's what we see going on today you know we are part of a time and part of a generation now that you can't even knock on the wrong door or accidentally pull in the wrong driveway or open a wrong car door without the risk of getting shot we are in a time a generation now where people do not respect their elders they fight teachers they skip school and care less about what their parents say we are in a time a generation now where nation leaders because of greed are now threatening to use nuclear weapons knowing what that would ultimately cause we are in a time a generation that anyone is willing to step on anybody on social media just to get a follow or a like 
we are in a time, a generation now that has no reference for the word, reverence for the word of God. We are in a generation, a time, look at this, that normalizes the same laws that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah for. We are in a time, a generation right now that is crooked and twisted. What do we do as children of God? Do we just stay in the four walls of our church and watch? Do we wait for others to become beacons for God? What do we do? If not you, who? Let me take you back to the scripture, Philippians uh, 2 and 14. It says, it says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Here in the text, we see Paul stating not to grumble. And theologians believe that Paul could have been talking to the church at Philippi here because they could have been grumbling towards God because of their present situation. Grumbling is also synonymous with murmur. Right. And we know and the Israelites, they murmur towards God. Right. If you go back to the book of Exodus, after God delivered them from the uh, Egyptians and they wanted more of what God was giving them, they started to murmur towards God. When people grumble and people murmur in the Bible, it was done towards God because of a present situation. We as a people in this generation, you know, we can't look at what's going on and just grumble and complain to God about his providence, about what he allows to happen. You know, it is because of sin that this world is what it is. You know, and, and let's keep it real. We, we often have conversations with each other, complaining and grumbling about all that's going on and in it. And, and many times we even question God, saying, God, how can you, uh, you know, allow this to be, allow everything that's going on? But let me say this to you. What does grumbling and complaining and murmuring do? It does absolutely nothing. I remember one time I was, uh, you know, given... I was talking to a group of people and we were talking about complaining and how we shouldn't complain and complaining doesn't do anything. And, you know, they were looking at me like I was crazy. So what I did was I put a table in the midst of them. Right. And I said, this table is not where it's supposed to be. Right. It's interfering with all of us. It's in the way. All right. It, it needs to be moved. Right. So so let's start complaining about that table being there. Right. So the whole everyone started complaining. They, they complained, they complained, they complained. And I let them go on for five minutes. It took them a little while to get them going. But they were complaining. They were talking about all the reasons why it shouldn't be there. What it's doing. They complained and complained and complained. But after five minutes, right, I stopped them. And I said, where is that table? And they said, it's right there. I said, did that table move? No, it's still right there. Right. What did complaining do? Right. It did absolutely nothing. All we did was talk and it just wasted time. So I told somebody, I said, can you please get up and move that table? They moved that table. They sat back down. I said, where's the table at now? They said, it's out of the way. It's over there. It's where it's supposed to be. And all it took was like five seconds just to move the table. It takes action. Complaining and murmuring does nothing. You know, many times we have to act. So I'm going to go back. Philippians 2, 12 through 13. Right. I'm going back. We were just talked about 14 and 15. And we're going to come back to that. But now I'm going to just two scriptures before. Paul says, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed. So now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and the work is for his good pleasure. Paul challenges the people here to work out their salvation. That's what he states. Now, let me put this in perspective. Paul was not saying work out your salvation in a way that you have to do something to be saved. He wasn't saying that. He was saying, listen, now that you are saved and you have salvation, you need to work it out. In other words, there, there's things you do. You're saved. Now, come on. You know, you need to you need to work it out. In other words, you can't just be saved and then act like you're not saved, right? When I'm saved, the Holy Spirit is now within me and it brings about a change in my life, right? And so when I work out my salvation, I'm not hiding that I'm saved. Rather, in my actions, people recognize that I'm saved, right? I should not be saved and folk around me do not know it, right? That means I'm not working my salvation out. I'm not doing anything or, you know, uh, uh, and, and, and look what the scripture said. Paul said, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence. Paul was saying, listen, I should not have to be there to motivate you to act like a child of God. Right? We should not have to come to church to be reminded that we are a child of God. Meaning that I should act like a child of God 24-7 and everyone around me should know that I am saved. So Philippians 2 and 13, uh, Paul says, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So Paul says that they must and can work out their salvation because it is God who is working within them. 
So because of the Holy because because the Holy Spirit's within me, and God is doing a work within me, and as a child of God, I have a great responsibility to be that witness that God is working within me and to be an ambassador for the Lord, right? And and because the Spirit was is within me, I can be that ambassador, I can be that representative of Christ, and I can walk with power, and I can walk with knowledge, and I can walk with confidence in this crooked and twisted world that we live in. And I can start taking some action. Right. Philippians 2 and 14 and 15. Again, it says here. Right. It says, do all things about grumbling and disputing that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of this crooked and twisted generation. Right. We live in a crooked and twisted generation. But as child, child, as a child of God, although this generation is crooked and twisted, I cannot be crooked and twisted. Right. If I'm saved, I can't act like I'm crooked and twisted, which means as a child of God, we have to be careful that we do not get caught up with the things that are going on in this world because we're not of this world. Right. Which means that watch this, we have to go against the grain because there are more people going the wrong way than there are going the right way. And we know that in Matthew 7, 13 through 14, Jesus says, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy, at least to destruction, and those who enter it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard, at least to life, and those who find it are few, right? So there's more people going the wrong way than there is going the right way, which means we, as Christians, when we live this life, we find ourselves going against the grain. And going against the grain is tough, right? Um, now, you're, you're cutting wood. Uh, when you cut wood, if you go cut the wood uh, with the grain, it's a lot easier. But if you cut it against the grain, it's tougher. And, and in the same way, when we're living this life in this generation, we're going against the grain, going against what everyone thinks is right, but it's not. And we know it's right. It is tough for us, but we must continue to do that because we are children of God. Right. So as we go against the grain, we don't just watch and allow others to go the other way without taking action. We don't do that. Paul stated in verse 16, he says, among whom you shine as lights in this world. Right. Look what Jesus stated in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 5 and 14, he says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Right. We are lights and we have to be lights in this generation that we are in. He goes on to state in verse 15, he says, nor do people hide nor, nor do people uh, light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all those in the house, right? So that's what we ought to do. You know, many times we sing this song, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. But do we truly let it shine or do we hide it? So then he goes on in verse 16 of Matthew 5. He says, in the same way, this is what he says. He says, let your light shine before others. So that they may see your good works and give glory to your father who is in heaven. This is a call for action, not for us to sit back in this crooked and twisted world. Right. And this is what we're charged to do, to let our light shine before others so that they see our good works. Right. So they can ask questions. Why do you act like that? Who, who, who what is that that, that that drives you? And we can let them know. And we have to do that in this crooked and twisted generation. You know, in John 12, 35, Jesus told him this. He says, you're going to have to have, uh, 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 he said, this is what he says. He says, you're going to have the light just a little while longer. He was talking, he says, walk in the light while you have it before darkness overtakes you. But then he goes on, he says, whoever walks in the dark does not know where they're going. You know, we want to know why this world is going crazy, why this world is the way it is. It's because they're not in the light. They don't have the light within them. They don't have Jesus. They don't have Christ. They don't have the Holy Spirit within them. So they're walking in darkness. And look, and they don't know where they're going. They're just doing whatever. They don't care. They're, and this is why this generation is the way it is, because they're walking in darkness. Right. So we have to be the light in this dark world. Right. And what are lights do? Lights. What are lights for? Lights are used to expose. Right. When lights come on, there are things that we see that we did not know are there. Right. So they're used to expose when people see us doing the right thing. They can't help but to reflect and see what they may have to get together themselves. And that has happened to us many times. We've seen people, you know, who, who are doing things for God and we see them, their light shining and we look at them and we say, oh my goodness, uh, I need to get myself together. There's some things I need to change so I can be that light like them, right? Lights exposed. Lights are also used to warn, right? We, uh, in, in this world, when we see a, a red and blue light that's warning us about, about something, something's going on, right? But, but we are lights and we, we are used to warn. Yes, we want to tell people about the good news and about Christ, 
but they also must know without Christ where they are headed, right? And this is why I'm telling you the good news so you don't have to continue to be heading in the wrong direction. Lights are also used to guide, right? When it's dark, we put on a flashlight, right? It guides us. So as lights, we guide, right? Through our actions and through our light shining, we guide others to Christ. And when we shine, we point people to Christ. Why do we do that? John 8 and 12, Jesus spoke to them saying, he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And this is why we point them to the light, right? We point them to where we are. You know, in this dark world that we live in, we must be lights, right? Lights that will shine, lights of hope, lights that will guide others to Christ. And guess what? This takes action. If not you, who? We can't wait others to step up. We, me, you must be the lights this world needs right now. If not you. God bless you. Amen. We hope that you were blessed by the word of God and you were able to reflect and really um, it was able to motivate you to be a light in this dark world uh, that we live in. Amen. Right now we want to offer the opportunity for someone to give their life to Christ. Maybe you heard something you want to be touched. Uh, maybe you're tired of walking in darkness and you know uh, that Jesus is the light of the world and you know you need him a part of your life. Well, you too can be saved. God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins and he offers this free gift, right? It's grace. Grace meaning that God gives it to us and although we don't deserve it, we can't do nothing to earn it, it's just free. And all we have to do is accept Christ into our hearts and we can be saved. And if that's what you wanna do, all you have to do is repeat after me. Uh, won't you do so right now and just close your eyes and say, Father, I admit that I have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And I confess him as my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, right now. Amen. If you have done that, we welcome you to the kingdom of God. We are excited, the angels are rejoicing, and we encourage you to get to a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church to learn more about God's word. Amen. To God be the glory, great things he has done. Also, if you would like to see this live, uh, please join us every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. Just go to our website, www.mcbcmh.org. Click on the live stream, and you can see this live every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. Also, maybe you would like to give a donation or a tithe. You can do that as well. Again, go to our website, www.mcbcmh.org. Click on the donate tab, and the directions will be there for you. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope that you have a wonderful, wonderful day. God bless you. At this time, we would like to remind our Mount Calvary members to send in their tithes and offerings. And if you would like to donate, you can go to our website and click the donate tab. You will also find on our website our weekly schedule. We hope you have been blessed. God bless.